Fasted for forty days, we become to him a nation everlasting, acquiring all our needs through fasting. Fasting cannot be without prayer. In humility and worship, they are up there. And our request before him. God of wonders, we thank you, Lord, that you know us, that you know us by name, that you know us uh, even before our birth, even before the creation of the world, that you had a plan and purpose for us, that you have carved our names into the palm of your hands, that, Lord, we are the apple of your eye. We ask, Lord, that you be in our midst, that you help us to know that today. We ask special blessing on this as he uh, speaks to us on your fatherhood and the fact that you know us. We ask that you be in our midst. You bless us. Amen. Is that going to do? Yes. seen in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus referred to God as Father. Today, we're going to go through the Sunday of today, the Sunday of the treasures, and as he is going to go through with us, how we're going to see God through the lens of God being our Father. Good afternoon, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Nazi. I just came from Egypt with Monique, my wife, and I want to thank her for her help in, uh, in preparing this talk. So can she get a clap, please? <laughs> Um, today we are going to talk about the topic that we all know by heart and we all believe in, but we believe in in our good times only and in our times of faith we don't believe in, but we need to be more consistent in our beliefs 
and in our relationship with God. So today we are going to tackle the topic of the providence of God, that our Father knows everything. Let's start our talk with what the Holy Spirit says in the book of Matthew. Chapter 6 and verse 8. Can anyone read the verse for us, please? Dina, please. Uh, therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of without you asking. What do you think? Raise your hand if you agree on the verse. Who agrees on the verse? We agree. Okay. So the majority agrees on the verse. So can anyone spot the wrong word in this verse? There is a wrong word. Let's read it once again. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have not in need of without you asking. What's the wrong word here? Asking. Yes, please. Sorry? It's not them, uh, sorry. It's not asking. Father. It's not father. <laughs> so what's the wrong word? What do you think? Here's the wrong word here, yeah, without. The wrong word is without. So the correct verse is, do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So my question for you today is why it's a before, not a without? What do you think? Why the scripture says, before you ask, not without you ask? Because he wants you to ask. Because he wants you to ask, yeah. What else? Hmm? You have to be in a state of humility in order to be able to ask Perfect. something or something. Speak of humility, thank you. What else? Okay, let's go through it. In the scripture, is stating two main facts. The first fact is our Father knows our needs. And the second one is our Father is waiting for us to ask Him. If we said without, so He, he doesn't need us to ask Him or to create this intimate relationship. Our Father is grasping the opportunity of our needs because He doesn't stop knocking at all the times, but we only open the doors of our hearts when we need something. So He grasps this opportunity of our needs to create this intimate relationship with us, to be one in Him. And as it says in the scripture, Yes. who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So what is the truth? What do you think about the truth is? Sorry? So what is the truth here? Any sharings, please? Our Lord is the truth the way of life. Yeah. So the truth is Him. As it says in the book of John, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So who can give us freedom except God? So He is the truth. Oh. And he grasped the opportunity of our needs to create this relationship with him, to create this bond with us. Let's move on to the next question. What happens when we ask? When we ask, there is some blessings that we receive. So what do you think? When we ask, what, what do you think it could happen? Let's take some sharing before going to the slide. Are you able to concentrate? Can you raise your voice, please? Yeah, it establishes a good relationship between us and God. Thank you. What else? Hmm. Okay, to practice patience. Okay, to practice patience. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Hmm. Anyone want to add something? We recognize. You must have been just more about ourselves and what, whether we actually Perfect. made this or not. Thank you. That's you. It forces us to recognize uh, whether we actually need, we are in need of that something that we desire. Perfect. You said it all. Almost. So I'm going to focus on three blessings that could happen and we receive when we ask. The first one, sometimes God needs us to discover that we have incomprehension of our true need. As you see in the picture, so this is the story of the Samaritan woman, okay? A good uh, guide or a tip to find the story of the Samaritan woman is the fourth Sunday of the Lent. So you find her story in the fourth book, the book of John, in chapter 4 and verse 4. Here is that story of the Samaritan woman. Can anyone read the story for us, please? Uh, Jesus answered and said to her, 
If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal uh, everlasting life. So he, the Samaritan woman, went to the well, and all what she was seeking is the water to keep her alive and to drink. And when she spoke to Jesus, he, he, led, us to, uh, he led her to identify her true need. What was her true need? She did not know the gift of God. And here the amazing thing in the scripture is that the gift of God is God himself. It's not a, a materialistic gift. It's not a tangible one. So the gift of God is God himself. And when we know God, this is the living water that becomes in us springing, a fountain springing up to everyone around us. So when we approach God, when we speak to him, when we ask him, he leads us to discover the incomprehension and our true needs. The second blessing that could happen when we ask is sometimes God reveals my depth and helps me identify that the direction I'm taking is right or wrong. Can anyone recall a story from the Bible where the direction was not right and when this person approached God, he adjusted his direction or her direction to make it easy? Yes, let's see, please. The rich man? The rich man? The rich man, yeah. But the example is another one. <coughs> Matthew himself. No. You just gave us one. Just focus on the picture. Nicodemus? No. Monique, you know what she can say. <laughs> is that the yeah? There are two there are two women. Yeah. Oh two one women. Is oh. Oh. Martha and Mary. Thank you. So here Martha was distracted with so much serving. She was distracted with so much serving. And then the scripture says, she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. So here I have three comments in this paragraph. The first one is that Martha approached Jesus. So how would Martha know that her direction is not correct if she didn't approach him? So when we ask, it helps us to adjust and identify our directions. The second comment is that Martha told, uh, told Jesus, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Sometimes we do the same. We blame Jesus. We blame God. We say to him, do you not care about my old car? Do you not care about my salary? Do you not care about my troubles in life? Even in the service, do you not care about them doing everything alone in the service without the help of anyone? So we do the same. So be sure when we start to blame God, when we start to say to God, do you not care about us? Be sure that you are taking the wrong direction. And even if God accepts us the way we are and he encourages us to ask him just to be, to, to create this relation with us and to adjust our direction. So the second thing that could happen when we ask, God reveals our depths and helps us identify our directions. The third one is sometimes God opens our eyes to see what is behind the scenes. And here it's not the scene itself, it's what we see. So another question, can you recall a story from the Bible where God allowed his people to see what are behind the scene? This is in the Old Testament. What was the question? Just sing together, yeah? <laughs> yes, thank you. I'll take you 2,700 years back in time. During the Syrian war to Israel, the king of Syrians sent his army to the city of Israel to bring him the prophet Elisha. And when the servant of Elisha saw this uh, huge army with a huge number of horses and chariots, he was terrified. Because he, he was thinking that two of them, only two of them, against a huge army. And then Elijah was speaking to him and praying for him. Can anyone read this for us, please? So we answer, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I, hope, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And 
behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around the nation. Thank you. So sometimes we are lacking of knowledge. We think we are lacking of powers. We think we are lacking of blessings. This is what the servant of Elisha was thinking about. We think we limit our perspectives on only what we see, but not what behind the scenes. But it's not a matter of every time we pray we shall see what's behind the scene. This is not the way God is treating us. But at least we need to learn not to limit our prayers to what we see only. Okay? Another story from the Bible, the book of Daniel. Okay? Daniel was devoting himself for prayers and fasting for three weeks, for three weeks, yes, for the restoration of his people from its captivity. And then after three weeks, he didn't get any answer. But after, at the end of the three weeks, he got the answer through a visitation from Archangel Gabriel, and he said to him, then he said to me, do not fear Daniel from the first day, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came and helped me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Here, the, the prince of kingdom of Persia is not a human being. As you can see, he is the spiritual ruler behind the earthly kingdom of Persia. So sometimes we don't see what's happening in the background. We don't see what's happening in the heavenly realm. But here, God answered Daniel's prayer from day one and sent Gabriel to save him or to, to, to respond to his prayer. But Gabriel was withstood in the heavenly realm for three weeks. So sometimes when we pray, God opens our eyes and see what is behind the scene. Any reflections so far? Can we move on? Okay. Thank you. The main question of today, we know that when we pray, many blessings happen. We know that God wants us to ask Him. But how God sees our prayers? Have you thought about it before? How God sees our prayers? When we pray, why sometimes He accepts our prayer? When sometimes He didn't accept it? So why it's happening? Have you thought about it before? It's not mm -hmm. according to his will. Sorry? Not according to his will. Yeah, not according to his will could be. What else? I mean, the silence or the no's is also an answer. Okay, thank you. Yes, please? It's not the right time. It's not the right time? Yes. Thank you. What else? <coughs> sometimes we're not sincere. Like, sometimes we're just saying, like, just to tick a box. Okay, sometimes we tick the boxes we are not sincere in our prayers. Thank you. He has a better plan for you. Sorry? Sometimes he has a better plan for you. He has a better plan for us sometimes, yeah? Thanks. What else? I mean, I heard a sermon yesterday about the story you shared about Martha when she said, don't you care? And um, just it's interesting that he said that story. But um, he was saying, what he was saying, like, when sometimes we feel that God's not listening or doesn't care, he's usually preparing us for life. Uh, another depth in our life, we're preparing us for something, like it doesn't have to be a negative thing, yeah. like I think it just makes us, he's preparing us for something more, and it's just a waiting period that can sometimes be very difficult. Thank you. Any other shades, please? Hmm. Okay, let's move on. So let's agree on a fact that God, generosity and abundance are ultimate. He wants to give us everything, but when we pray, our prayers submit to certain stages. I would describe it as gears, and we will know later on why I call it gears. And these stages are how God sees our prayer. And God honors every single word and thought we reflect in our prayer. Okay? Is what we said already? The first gear is how do we ask? It talks about our drivers and our motives. Okay? Here in the, in the scripture it says you ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on, you, on your pleasures. And our teacher David in the psalm says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So here we can see two opposite behaviors. Can you spot the behaviors here? The first one, it's not the motive by the way, it's that the pleasure, your own pleasure, your false pleasure, the pleasures. And the second behavior, the good one, is that we delight ourselves in the Lord first. And then when we delight ourselves in the Lord, He is pleasure to give us everything and all the desires of our heart. 
So here's the question for oneself. What about my motives? Our modern lifestyles made us trooped and cooped up in cubicles behind the screens. So sometimes we pray and ask for something and we are driven by the peer pressure, the people we, say around, we see around us. And sometimes we are driven by another wrong motives. So what about my motives? And does my request boost up my egoism or not? Do I think about others or only myself? And lastly, what is my real pleasure? Do I delight myself in the Lord or not? Or I usually try to ask for earthly matters. The second year is about our inner or outer self. It's about the growth. Is my prayer promoting for the growth of my inner or outer self? In the Ephesians, St. Paul says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So, the question to oneself also, how far will my request contribute in the flourishment of my inner self? Is my request for my inner or outer self? If my request was answered, would it make me a good vessel for God to dwell in me? What do you think about it? Have you considered these prayers in this manner before? Have you measured your prayer on this scale before? If my request was answered, would it make me a good vessel for God or not? If I got a new job, if I got a new car, if my bank account was building up with high credits, will it be a good vessel for God or not? It doesn't mean that money or the ambition at work is not something good. It is good, but everything shall work in this to, be, to, to make from me a good vessel for God to dwell in me. So God is promising to give us richly as long as we ask for the growth of our inner self. Okay? Any questions so far? We still have seven years, so you really want to memorize them. So the first one was about our motives, how I ask, and the second one, inner or outer self. The third one, will my prayer make a better or bitter for body of God? Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Someone uh, um, told humble at the, at the beginning, yeah, that's you maybe, yeah. You, you, you spoke about how to be humble, okay? And we, we have to be on the same mind towards one another. Usually when we pray, we think about ourselves and our needs. But have you thought before, when you pray, what is the impact of your prayer on the other members of the body of Christ? What the impact on them? First one, do we consider the impact, this broader view, the impact of our prayer on the other parts of the body of Christ? Do we think about our brethren when we pray? When, if our prayer was answered, will it bless them or make them stumble? Can you give me an example about, I can pray for something, and someone else, when he sees the answer for my prayer, it can make him stumble? Can you think about it? It's not from the Bible, but... Yes, I paid for a promotion. Yeah. There are other people asking for this promotion. Yeah. So if I took it, <laughs> could be they, they might need it more, more than you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. What else? A well of man. He has in his family some brothers and sisters, some family members in need. And when he prays, he usually asks for himself only without mentioning his brother in his prayer. Without thinking, when he prays to God to give him more. What about my brothers and sisters? Do I ask God to give them more or not? If God gives me everything I ask for and they are still in need, will they be stumbled or not? Will it make them stumble or not? So we have, when we pray, to ask and think about our brethren and the body of Jesus Christ. The fourth year is about the mission. Every one of us and each one has his own mission in life. Everyone has his own mission. Even if we don't know our mission, it's not totally clear for us at the moment, but our prayers, our prayers shall be in the light of our mission. If you don't know your mission, just ask for it. If you don't know the mission, just submit to God who purifies your prayers and your needs to be in the light of your mission. He says in the epistle to the Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. So here, God is promising us with three things. First one, enlightened heart. 
Do we pray for our heart to be enlightened or not? Have we thought before our heart will be enlightened? We know the scripture by heart, but is this heart enlightened or not? The point enlightened is not. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the question is, can you elaborate more what do you mean by heart enlightenment? Okay. Here when St. Paul was talking and speaking to, to the Ephesians, he was speaking about the enlightened heart. Um, like that, the story of the rich man, he told to Jesus, I know all the scripture, I, I know it all by heart. But the, his heart, was it, was it enlightened or not? When he was asked to leave what he has, did he obey? No. Because he only used this heart to know the scripture. But he, he don't, sometimes we know the scripture, but we don't act according to this. Okay? Does this answer the question? Okay. Okay. Anyone can answer this question if you have another thought? It's Photosynthesis, so it's, it's literally to have your heart uh, be enlightened by, by his glory, by his will, by understanding of what he wants, or what he intended you to become when he first created you. Thank you. Uh, we can say that an enlightened heart, too, is a heart that's willing not only, like you said, to obey or to know the scripture, but to obey it. To act with the scripture, that's how the heart becomes enlightened and willing to follow the hope to which he has called you. Thank you. Yes, please. Is it fair to say, like, the mission is, I guess, for the gospel, for people to know God? So all of us have this as our general mission, but also we have different vocations. So it might be that, you know, by us being faithful in our work, or some people are more able to preach, other people are more able to care or to serve in different ways. We might have our specific calling or vocation, but there's a general mission for all of us. Is that right? Yeah, I think it makes sense, yeah. Um, yeah, do you want to add something, Alina? Okay. Yes. I think it's more when you are going into a dark room and then you have some light in your hand, Other shades, please. The key number five sheds light the light on our future. Will my prayer lead me to a hopeful or a hurtful future? Um, let's admit that all what we know at the moment is the here and now, and only God who knows our future, and only Him He knows the impact of my prayer on my future. Um, someone mentioned the timing when we asked. While we pray. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, say the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and hope. Here the Lord is promising us these three main things. Hope in the midst of wait. Okay? Sorry, peace in the midst of wait and hope for what is coming and the guaranteed future. So the question here, how will our prayer give us peace and create a hopeful future? I might pray for something because I see it now and I want it now, but I don't know the impact of this thing on the future. And we all experience so many situations when we prayed for something and this didn't happen, and in the future we realized that God had a better plan for us. So do we trust in God's promises? He promises us with, with peace, to give us peace, hope and future. Do we trust in His promises or not? And I, I usually like to uh, describe God's knowledge like the GPS. The GPS usually knows three main things where I'm coming from, and where I am now, and where I'm heading to. And God, He knows everything. He does not only know the future, but He sees the future. God is above the limitations of time. He is beyond the time. He is superior. 
in time. He's not time bound. So he, he sees the past and the present and the future, all of them now at the moment. So we have to trust in his judgment. We have to trust in his justice. He sees everything and he leads us to the best route, to the best future. Okay? Maybe number six is about the destination. Is my destination, is my prayer focused on earthly or eternal things? Let's agree that heaven is our origin and shall be our destination. We are created for heaven. All this, all this is evidence that God's judgment is right and as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. So when we ask, do we care about our preparation for the eternal kingdom or not? Or I think about my life on earth, about my, uh, my job stability, about my family, on earth only or we think about the eternal life, we think about the kingdom. Do we doubt that this is God's top priority for us? Do you doubt that this, the God's priority and plan for us all to go to the kingdom, to earth, where are the heirs of the kingdom? Sorry, I had no one Do we trust in his justice and righteousness in times of pain? Even this is a challenge. Here comes the challenge. When we suffer, we are suffering from something, we are experiencing some pain in our life. Do we trust in God's justice? Because this pain, this suffering purifies our hearts to be worthy of the kingdom. The seventh, the final year, is about is our prayer will get us exposed or protected from evil power. In the story of Job, when Satan wanted to tempt Job, he went to God and said to him, Can anyone read for us, please? Can you? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. It's very obvious here that God is aware of the spiritual battle that we suffer in our life. Here the Satan went to God and said to him, Have you not put a hedge around him? God is putting a hedge around every one of us. And Satan is aiming for God and asking God to stretch out his hand on us or from us to, to start and tempt us in our lives. Here, will our desires drag us out of the protection zone? So God is protecting us. He is putting a hedge around us in our lives. In the story of Job, Satan could not affect Job's life as per God's command because God was putting a hedge around him and Job was keeping himself safe within the protection zone. In the story of the deception, when Adam and Eve were tempted, and then they dragged themselves out of the protection zone. They were exiled from the paradise of joy because they obeyed to Satan. They took themselves out of the protection zone. Here, in the epistle of St. Peter, it says, Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So our enemy, we are not, our battle is not with flesh and blood. Our enemy, he is like a roaring lion. Yes, he is chained, but if you approach, the zone of his chain will be affected, he will attack you. So we shall stick in this protection zone and God is trying his best to make ourselves, to make us in this protection zone in order not to be exposed to the evil power. So let's wrap up the seven pieces together. In this verse that we all know by heart, I have an exercise for you now. And we know that all things work. Huh? Work together, yes, thank you. Four. For good, yes, thank you. To those who love God, to those who are the cold, thank you. According to his purpose. Thanks a lot. So all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the cold according to his purpose. And this is why we described how God sees our prayers and we describe it with the gears. So all the gears, all things shall work for good. God is harmonizing all the gears together. Sometimes when we pray, we put our focus on certain gears and discard the others. And in any mechanism, if all the gears are not working properly, if one of the gears stopped working or it was dislodged from its location, the whole mechanism collapses, it stops working. So this is a mechanism that happens, this is how God sees our prayer. When we pray, He makes all the gears in harmony, He harmonizes all the gears together. If our prayer 
doesn't check the seven keys. What could happen? What do you think? It's not a certain thing that every, every time we pray, our prayer self submit to the seven gears. So what could happen? Sorry? Yeah, so what happens if our prayers doesn't check all the seven gears at the time? Yes. This is where God directs our prayers in a sense when you mention like the redirection to, to make it fit the gears. Exactly. Thank you. If our prayers, you want to say something? Okay. If our prayers doesn't check the seven gears, here God rule, God's rule comes in. God's rule comes in the scene. Either He redirects the desires of our heart, or He postpones His answer, or He does not answer because the seven gears will not be harmonized. So it's good to think how God sees our prayers, okay? Again, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Let's wrap up the keys together now. So the first one was how our and our motives, how we ask. The second one, inner or outer self. Third one, better or bitter for the body of Christ. And then convergent or divergent for my mission. And then hopeful for a hurtful future, earthly or eternally, and finally protected or exposed to evil powers. As we grow in our knowledge of our Father, it's time to be more practical. So we now, we know how to ask, we know what happens when we ask, and we know how God sees our prayers. We are fortunate because we had the best teacher in life, we had Jesus Christ who taught us how to pray. When the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray, he told them, don't be like the hypocrites and the heathen who use vain repetition in their prayer, and they think that they will be heard for their many words. But when we pray, he taught us the, the Lord's Prayer. Let's see the reflection and how to pray using the Lord's Prayer. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When I say this, when I pray, it shall gives me my identity. So our identity is that He is our Father, and He is in heaven. We are created in heaven. We are His sons and daughters. So this shall be our identity, and our identity, hallowed be Thy name. So the fatherhood of God defines our being. We are His living icon on earth. We are created in His image. So this shall be our identity, and all our actions actions shall glorify His holy name. Okay. As it says in the epistle to the Corinthians, do not you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Let's read the same verse differently. Do we know that we are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in us? So we shall know. So our fatherhood, the fatherhood of God, defines our identity. Second one, Jesus followed and said, Thy kingdom come. When we say thy kingdom come, what, what comes in our mind? When we say this, we shall identify and define our purpose in life. We are the heirs of the heavenly kingdom, and this should be our purpose in life. Because when we say this, we shall see God's kingdom, this is our purpose, and commend the earth to God. So we are not the heirs of the kingdom alone, it's our purpose in life to commend the earth to God. We are the heirs of the mighty kingdom, as we said before. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So we are Christians, our purpose shall be different than anyone else. And then Jesus followed and said, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this assigns my mission. Our mission shall be to do his will, to fulfill God's will and mission on earth. We are his beloved agents who he have put out his trust in us to fulfill his mission. And we are honored with this responsibility to fulfill his, of his will on earth. As it says in Corinthians as well, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Let's wrap up and admit that the heavenly and the Lord, sorry, the Lord's prayer is very deep. It is very deep. If we say it very quickly when we pray, we cannot feel it. But if we feel every single word in it, it will establish in us these three pillars our identity, our purpose, and our mission. 
And when these pillars become the foundation of our prayer, all our needs will fall, in, will fall into their proper place. All our needs, we will know how to ask for them in the right context, in the right order. And we will know how God thinks about our prayer. But this should be the foundation. After this being the foundation, all the needs fall into their proper place. And we will know how to ask and delight in God's abundance. Let's recap together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It shall give me my identity. That thy kingdom come, it defines my purpose in life. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It assigns my mission. Let's contemplate furthermore in the incarnation. I like the story of the incarnation and so many blessings we receive from the incarnation. But I will focus on two things that relate to our talk. The first one, that our teacher didn't taught us, didn't teach us, sorry, uh, by words, rather by actions. So we saw Jesus praying and we heard him praying right before the crucifixion. And this is one of the deepest prayers or the deepest one in the Bible. And this chapter in John 17, when he was speaking to God the Father and was saying, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. And here Jesus is teaching us how to acknowledge our identity. He acknowledged this identity during his life on earth as he is one with the God the Father. They are one. Father, the hour has come, glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. So this, is, this was his identity that he acknowledged right before the crucifixion. He prayed for his identity. And then Jesus followed and said, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus here talks about the purpose. This was the purpose of the incarnation. The incarnation's purpose was to give people the eternal life. And Jesus followed and defined the eternal life, that the eternal life is to know God, is to grow in God's knowledge. What does it mean? This means that the eternal life do not, does not start when we depart this life, but it starts now when we grow in the knowledge of God. And then Jesus followed and said, I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He is, here Jesus is talking about his mission. And he said to God, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. What a wonderful feeling when we stay and when we stand before God with an empty hands and say to him, I have finished the work you have given me to do. I have fulfilled your mission, God, on earth. So here Jesus established the identity, purpose, and mission while he was praying before the crucifixion. The second blessing of the incarnation is that our God, he does not only know our needs, but he experienced it himself. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He is a wonderful father. He does not only know our needs, but he experienced all our feelings, all our pain. He experienced so many hard feelings, like he was depressed, he was forsaken and rejected from his people. He faced many tribulations during his teaching. He faced the solitude when all his disciples and all his people left him alone before the crucifixion. And he faced the betrayal from Judah. And finally, a shameful death. So he experienced everything. When you speak to him, you have to be mindful. You have to trust that he experienced all these feelings, all these pain. What a wonderful God who chose willingly to carry our souls to give us eternity. So he experienced all our heart feelings. So be confident when you speak to him, he knows everything and he felt before everything. I think uh, this is the last section in the talk. As we grow in God's knowledge, as we are more practical, it's time to enjoy the promises and the heavenly rewards. Number one, the heavenly reward is aligning with what the church is celebrating today, Treasure Sunday. Can anyone read this for us, please? Yeah. Can you? Do not fear the flock, for it is your father's good pleasure. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, 
treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches, no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Thank you. Some contemplations, please. Anyone wants to comment or add something here? Identify our true needs and redirect our path. We come to the knowledge of the treasure that we need to put that's uh, to be treasured in heaven, not on earth. And we start to do this uh, naturally, it becomes a part of who we are. Thank you. Yes, I was listening to a sermon that was talking about that Christ doesn't condemn the treasure, he condemns, like, he kind of brings your attention to where you put that treasure. So it's kind of like, where do you put? your effort and if we're talking about prayer is like is your prayer just focused on just the earth like the matters of the earth or are you praying for something higher than that so that's like yeah where you invest your time and your effort and your resources is where your heart will be thank you any other things please we have lots of selling to do mm -hmm. we have lots of selling to do yeah <laughs> <laughs> So this is the abundance mindset. To give, not to take. We are talking about the providence of God. Rather, we need to mention what is the abundance like. What is the abundance mindset? To give, not to take. To be blessed and overflow with blessings for people who are around me. Because our Father is generous. And in this manner, we will lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. So this is the first heavenly reward, is that we are going to live in abundance mindset. The second one, we will rejoice the gift of salvation. As we told before, the gift of God is God himself. We we'll enjoy our relationship with our omnipotent, unlimited and unchangeable Father. As it says in the epistle to the Romans, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So if you think about your needs as compared with what you already had with this gift, they're very small, they're very simple. So he will give you, but, he, but with him, is with him all things. He will graciously give us all things with him. And the third thing, God does not only know yet the desire of his heart is to share with us this knowledge, to share this knowledge with his beloved people, with us, and create this intimate relationship with us. This intimate friendship and relationship, it's obvious in the life of Abraham. When God said in the Genesis, how shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? He is my friend. How shall I hide from him what I'm doing? And here, this verse is John 15, 15. I believe we can take away this verse from today's talk. It says it all. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. What an honor to be the friend of God. It reflects a mutual love and trust to be his friend because the desire of his heart is it's his ultimate pleasure and the desire of his heart to share his knowledge with his beloved people and with us. Uh, so I have finished. Um, finally, thank you, Father, for your providence. And uh, briefly, your Father knows everything, but please do not stop asking and enjoy God's providence and abundance in your life. Thank you. last week from Mina on the fatherhood of God, continuing with that with today's, and next week we've got a Buna continuing that same theme. Oh, guys, we'll just read the, the Psalm, Psalm 139 that uh, has got for us. Uh, I'll, uh, Jesse, can you see it from there? 
psalm there. Yeah. Can you lead us in it? Because you're a good distance so everyone can hear. Okay. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. O oh Lord, you will search me and know me. You know my sitting down and my standing up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my father and my life. and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed. And in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. me, O God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, there should be more number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. O oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me to the way everlasting. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> 